Hello, everyone, and welcome to the premiere episode of Five Fragen, or Five Questions, as we would say in English. This is our new video podcast featuring the people who are at the heart of the Netherlands' diplomatic network here in the U.S. We'll talk with the diplomats and policy officers about the strong bonds between the United States and the Netherlands, as well as our diplomatic work here in the U.S. We'll focus on our cultural and economic ties that go back more than 400 years. And we'll talk about the collaborations between our two countries that make our relationship a partnership that works. I'm Jeff Alanak from the Embassy's Communications Office, and I'm here with my first guest, none other than Ambassador Andre Hospels. Thank you for joining me today, Ambassador. Glad to be here, Jeff. Great. Let's jump right into it with the first question. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but for those who don't know, what is your background and how did you become the Dutch ambassador to the United States? Well, I was born in the uh, early 60s in a small place called Uithoorn, which is just south of uh, Amsterdam. I was raised in a small town family with two brothers. I went to school in uh, my, uh, my village and then I studied political science at the university in, uh, in Amsterdam. And I applied for a job uh, for, for an education, a training, a diplomatic training at the foreign ministry. And uh, I passed the exam. So since then I've been working for the foreign ministry. Uh, I've had different postings uh, abroad, in Sri Lanka, in Brussels, in South Africa twice, Vietnam, and now in the United States. And in between, I've had many different jobs in the, uh, in the foreign ministry. My family, actually, uh, both my parents have died, but um, my father was an active uh, 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 salesman. He was uh, active in the flower sector. First, he bought flowers and brought them before the, uh, before the auction in, uh, in Aalsmeer, which has the largest flower auction in, uh, in Europe. And later on he started importing uh, both orchids and ferns from uh, countries like Thailand, Singapore, Australia, and also the ferns from, uh, from Florida, United States. So yeah, that's a little bit my background. So was it your father's job that got you interested in international? Yeah, it was a combination. I've always been interested in foreign languages, English and French. I'd like to travel. My parents were actually one of the first who in the 70s went with their children to Spain for having a summer holiday in winter. That was relatively new then. And I liked, you know, traveling and being abroad. And then, um, yeah, that's actually how it started. Interesting. Okay. What do you find to be your biggest challenge as an ambassador and how do you overcome it? Well, as an ambassador, uh, you represent your country, uh, both the interests of your country and the values where you stand for. Uh, And that's sometimes a challenge because the environment can be very different from where you come from. Uh, For instance, I've been posted in Vietnam and there they have a different approach to life, to studying, to work to certain values, liberal values, where we stand for. So it's important that you remember where you come from and what your job is abroad. So that's, that's a challenge sometimes. But on the other end, building bridges is one of our core tasks. Another challenge is linked to our profession, and that is that often as a diplomat, you don't go abroad alone, but you often take your, your partner and your children. And it's a challenge for them as well to be abroad, to get used to a different country, a different social network, children that have to leave their old school and go to a new school, make new friends, get used to new teachers. Sometimes they have to learn a different language. So I think uh, there is a professional challenge, but there's also a personal challenge. And I think the personal challenge is very much to make sure that not only Uh, you yourself as a diplomat are happy abroad in your work, but also that your family is uh, is happy abroad. I could see how that would be a challenge. Yeah. Then could probably make for some interesting discussions between terms, like where are you going to go next? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a system that after four years, uh, normally a term is four years, so that means in the third year there is a a list published with vacancies uh, that will be <coughs> become available the next year. And if you're in that round, you can register your, uh, your, your preferences. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that you always get one of your preferences. And this discussion at home is always with the family and see where they would like to go to and uh, where they think they can have a good school, but also a nice life. So that's always um, 
uh, around September, October. That's always a, a special period in our family, once in four years, when we have to start that discussion again. It sounds like you might be in the middle of it now. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that later. One of the highlights of any ambassador's term must be participating in a royal visit, which you did earlier this month. When this visit was announced, both King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima were going to visit both Texas and California. The king fell ill and couldn't make the trip, though he is on the mend. Nevertheless, we know the visit was a success, at least in terms of Americans becoming more acquainted with the Netherlands and the Dutch companies that do business here in the U.S. But what stood out for you? Well, a number of things. First, I would say uh, the queen. I think um, the way she represents the Netherlands uh, is outstanding. And she was received by so many enthusiasm at every level, whether we had political discussions with the governor or whether we had uh, business visits or round tables. Uh, they were always enthusiastic about uh, meeting with the Queen, uh, but also even more about the discussion that they had on specific subjects. So that was, I think, outstanding. I was also impressed by the number of CEOs that were part of the delegation, specifically in sectors like life science and health, sustainability and, and linked to energy. And I've been impressed by <coughs> the, uh, the possibilities that exist in the two states that we visited. California and Texas, the possibilities that are there for a strengthening uh, Dutch-American cooperation in many sectors. And to give you just one example, Galveston is an area close to the coast in, uh, in, in, in Houston, uh, Texas, <coughs> where we are currently looking at building barriers in order to deal with uh, floods and uh, high-rise uh, sea levels. And that is something that we, the Dutch, are good at. There are long existing contacts already between the Netherlands and uh, the authorities in Houston and Galveston. But now it really looks like uh, the plans are going ahead. The design is there, the building can start, the follow-up has to take place. So that, I think, was an impressive example of what Dutch-American cooperation, where it can lead to. Interesting. That actually leads into my fourth question. Out, out of the 50 U.S. states, how did the royal couple choose to visit these two? Well, it's, I think it's always difficult to choose between states. In 2015, the royal couple was here when they visited Chicago, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., and Michigan. This time we looked for uh, states where there are large uh, business opportunities, but where we can also do where we can also cooperate on the common challenges that we face. Uh, and these common challenges are issues like climate change, like increased technology, like how do we deal with innovation in the life, uh, life science and health uh, sector, how do we deal with um, innovations in our education system, how can universities work more closely together. So we visited Berkeley, we visited Stanford, um, so these two states were ver very much fitted under the umbrella of the common challenges. And of course, they are tremendous economic powerhouses. They are respectively the seventh economy in the world, Texas, and the tenth economy in the world, California. So there, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for cooperation there. Must have been a tiring trip going from California to Texas. It was four days, so you were in... California for two days, Texas for yeah, two days. Yeah. Must have been exhausted. It was no, well, it was a tough trip, but you know, uh, it gives you a lot of energy as well. Long days, but uh, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of um, creativity in the program as well. And, um, I, you know, I must really thank all those colleagues who prepared uh, the visit, uh, both uh, in San Francisco, our consulate general, and also in Miami, who deals with Texas as a as one of their uh, states in their resort. It was exhausting, but it was also very rewarding in a way that you see that in the end, everybody was actually happy about the visit and about the meetings that they had. Yeah, so uh, it's work hard, uh, play hard. So after uh, hard work, we're all allowed to uh, relax a little bit now. Nice. For my fifth question, it, you gave a little bit uh, of an answer earlier, but it's September now and you're in your final year of your time here in the U.S. What else are you looking forward to? Yeah, that's a good question, Jeff. And um, well, first of all, I would have loved to stay longer in the United States because I think it's a great country to, to work in, but also to live in. And, and what I like in postings is if there are uh, possibilities for cooperation between the Netherlands and the country where you are posted. And obviously that's the case uh, here. So I'm, I'm 
it's not going to be nicer, I think, my next posting than here in the United States, not in terms of the size and the impact of the bilateral relations, but also, for instance, not in the size of the diplomatic network. We have an embassy, we have five consulates general, we have uh, <coughs> 26 honorary consuls, we have Netherlands business support offices here and innovation offices. So it's a tremendous diplomatic network that we have here, the biggest in the world. So I, I should look for countries where um, cooperation between uh, the Netherlands and that specific country is also very strong. And uh, I'll have to wait for the list and see what fits uh, into these criteria. These criteria. The other possibility always is to go uh, back home and see if there's still something relevant for me to do back in The Hague. It'll probably be my last posting or maybe one and a half posting to go. So we'll see. We've always been flexible. Do you mean before you retire? Before I retire, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when we studied the list, um, it was always a discussion between uh, my wife and myself and our four children. Our four children has, have left the house now. They're all studying in the Netherlands or working. So we thought it would be nice uh, for them if we would be a little bit closer to them in Europe, either in The Hague or a European country. But when we you know, discussed that with them, they actually said, no, no, it would be great if you can still go to a country far away because we are happy to visit you <laughs> in other sites, in other parts of the world as well. May, maybe we end up in, in China or Japan or Indonesia, somewhere in Asia. But at least for me, as I mentioned, it's important that there are possibilities for bilateral cooperation. Well, it sounds like an exciting time ahead. Absolutely. I have one final question for you. I understand you have two pets at home, a chocolate lab named Baloo, who has an Instagram account, by the way, and a cat named Simba, who does not have an account. So I have to wonder, is Simba ever jealous of Baloo? <laughs> and how does Baloo take pictures without scratching or slobbering all over his phone? <laughs> Well, first of all, Jeff, I have two cats. We have two cats. It's not only Simba, but it's also Mufasa. Well, Mufasa, I forgot about Mufasa. <laughs> yeah. So are they on a different social media platform? Nah, no, they're both, uh, I would say, less prominent in the media than Baloo. I don't know why, they're Maine Coons, that's the, uh, the breed. Uh, they're more on themselves, but they are very good friends between themselves and with Baloo. No, Baloo is a kind of uh, media personality. And he's very much liked by everybody. So if you visit our residence, uh, he's always around. <coughs> you, you would notice because when he enters, he, uh, he sniffs a little bit to everybody and then he finds a nice place. And then for the rest, he doesn't bother anybody anymore because he falls asleep. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he's not interested in the kind of discussions that we have. And it became actually um, a habit that high-level visitors like ministers took a picture with Baloo, so we have quite a few uh, ministers uh, on Baloo's Instagram account um, uh, posing at the residence and there are some funny texts written by my daughters who, uh, who comment on these, uh, on these pictures. So often Baloo discussed with uh, the Minister for Education, for instance, the possibilities for better education for pets in the United States and in the Netherlands. I'm sure he has lots of thoughts on that, right? <laughs> he has many thoughts on that. So yeah, but it's the thing is, I must say, Americans like dogs. And uh, sometimes if I have guests, people could be a little bit impressed by um, the residence in a way that is formal and it's a bit classic and traditional. But a dog is often an icebreaker. So if people come, come in and they see a dog walking around, it's, uh, it's a good conversation started, but it also breaks down the formal atmosphere a little bit. So yeah, I would say that Baloo, but also Simba and Mufasa are certainly an important part of our uh, diplomatic network here in Washington as well. I must admit, I've seen Baloo several times, but I've never seen Mufasa and Simba. And maybe that's because I have a cat at home and maybe they smell him and yeah. so they run away. Uh, but uh, I'll introduce you to them uh, <laughs> next time. I'll have to be sure, yes. I am a cat person. All right, so that's all right. Well, well that's, that's all we have time for today. Thank you again, Ambassador, for joining me for the first episode of Five Fragen. Though I think I might have asked a few more than five questions. I'll have to work on that next time. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Please tell us what you think in the comments below, and be sure to click on the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss our next episode or the other videos we post on our YouTube channel. I'll be back behind the microphone next month with another member of the Dutch Diplomatic Network in the United States. Until then, you can keep up with our work on any of our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. 
Just search for NL in the USA and you can stay up to date on how the United States and the Netherlands have a partnership that works. Thank you again, Ambassador. You're welcome, Jeff. My pleasure.